Hi, I'm Barbara, the ringleader at ProjectKin.org. I'm recording this now in Berkeley, California, where, as Project Kin, we're sponsoring the Pacific edition of All About That Place, with live talks benefiting the rest of us on the far side of the planet from London. As English speakers in this faraway diaspora, place has a starring role in our family stories. For those of us who were not First Peoples, the migrations that brought us here from our homelands in Asia, Africa, and Europe were often complicated by force, economic need, or religious persecution. These became our origin stories, often so wrenching that our connections back to the home country are lost. If we were lucky enough to trace our history to migrating ancestors, the stories probably involved a leap of faith or a pursuit of dreams. We've intermarried and changed names, often moved dozens of times in a lifetime. Home means less when you have no idea where your grandparents lived. These New World and Pacific migrations have fed a different sense of place. It's also added to the richness of our family stories. In conversations, I've seen how this sense of place can reflect layers of the other people who have lived, loved, or fought in the same place. That leads me to what I hope will be my contribution to this conversation, all about that place. You see, my primary mission for Project Kin is to help people tell their stories. That means that this complexity and richness can be the enemy. It can overwhelm the simple desire to tell a story or to share a story you were told. In this talk, I'd like to show you how reframing a family story into a project can help it get this important job done. It can help release a story from the confines of form so you can improve on it, adding it to the growing narrative arc of your family. So I have another way to look at it. You may be the only person on the planet who knows the story you want to tell. Perhaps it draws on the memories of aging elders or offers something important to inspire young children. If you remember nothing else from this talk, let it be this. An untold story is a story lost. If the story is important, let yourself get creative. The best way to get creative is to take the rules away and have fun. One of the first rules is that storytelling has to be a written narrative, something with a beginning, middle, end, uh, protagonists, villains, drama. Does an opera, play, or film tell a story? Of course it does. But does a Chinese landscape painting? What about a video game? or an interactive collage. Now, I'm not challenging you to take up brush painting, but I am saying that if you can bring your listener along with you on a journey, then I'd say you've got enough of a narrative through line to constitute a story. Is it a classic narrative arc? Maybe not. That's okay. Get the story told. Capture your sources and let descendants build on your contribution. A very special element of family history storytelling is that it's inherently iterative. The story you tell about your 18th century Revolutionary War heroes may be updated by your great-grandchildren a century from now. As family history storytellers, what pulls our stories together may be individuals, bloodlines, events, things, and places. Narrative threads weave them together. There are gifted writers out there, and they can need to continue to hone their craft. The rest of us shouldn't despair. If we measure failure by the loss of an untold story, then it's a win to capture our stories in any form. Projects help us do that, one building block at a time. Too often within a family, we get hung up on the complexity of formal storytelling that we leave most of the important stories untold. Sometimes these important stories are the secrets, the uncomfortable truths. They aren't fun and may never be shared publicly, but capturing them is important. It's personal for me, and I know it is for many family historians. Too many secrets in my own family have sent me on a mission to get stories told in any way I can. Today we have technologies available to capture stories in private and in context so that their lessons can be passed down. A conversation with a grandchild to explain why their grandfather won't talk about his childhood might be an example. Explaining the larger context of war, poverty, or divorce can be difficult at the dinner table. Turning it into a private project, even one done together, 
can raise its priority and communicate the message in context without putting it on display. Conversations can create precious artifacts to be woven into other storytelling forms later. They might be future projects of your own, but they might also be artifacts for a grandchild to come back to, to tell the story later with time and distance that hard stories need to marinate. Now let me pause to consider another important part of family history storytelling, artifacts. As the family archivist, you may also have received an inheritance of copied, faxed, or handwritten family stories, envelopes and boxes stuffed with family trees, transcripts, and photos. Does that mean that the printed page is the only form of storytelling? Not at all. Let's look at some examples. In 2023, Simon Davies of the We Are Archive shared a project with us at Project Kin to show how he turned family story vignettes captured in his We Are Archive into playing cards. Each card includes a unique reference to an ancestor, their home, or artifacts they loved. What's remarkable about this is how it creates a narrative that can be followed at leisure. Kids playing hearts with a deck of cards can pause to explore the story of their two ex-great-grandfathers' heroism in the Great War. A story that might never have connected with those kids, but captured in a link that takes them back to the detail in the archive, it turns it into a fun game of discovery. In the archive, it might be captured in prose or perhaps photographs, captions, and a timeline. Does it matter? Does it count? If the story is conveyed and the child is inspired, I would say it's better than a written narrative. This creates the lingering aroma of a good story. Because modern media makes it so easy to repurpose materials, we have to consider not only the story, but how to make source materials available to a new generation. We must respect the materials and the stories. This teaches rising generations the principles of privacy, context, and citations. Materials can also introduce the fluid movement between digital and physical materials as a form of storytelling. In my example of playing cards, the most important thing is that the kids played cards. That's about as tactical and real world as it gets. Don't fuss over keeping cards pristine. They're easy to replace today with printing. It's so much more important that they actually get used and played. Let the cards do their job. Time for a new pack? Rope the kids in this time to create their own variations. For them, it's an opportunity for a remix and to create stories for their descendants. We've been remixing ancestors' stories since the first campfire. Each new generation that hears that old story about old Uncle Festus and digs into the archives and comes up with more details about the chimney or what happened to his cane. When you think of your storytelling effort as a project, it can be anything and convey a story in any form. It can even be a collaborative project, something tackled in coordination with siblings, cousins, or grandparents. You might even consider creating a timeline together, each researching different components of the story. For example, a model railway layout of a home village that gets everyone involved. One person can research the timeline while others create replicas of little houses and shops. Another person can create QR codes that go back into an archive with written narratives, videos, or photographs from each spot. I mention these kinds of examples precisely because they aren't technical. Look, I'm nerdy. I find that thinking back to how we have historically told stories in the real world lets us circle back to our modern world and see how we could build on that. As Project Kin, we call these recipes for projects. I use that term because recipes are really just ideas complete with how-to instructions for a given implementation. Now, recipes not only show you how to do something, they also give you permission to try things you might have been afraid to tackle on your own. When you look at a storytelling effort as a project, you can get more creative and focus less on classical forms and more on what your audience wants to understand, remember, and connect with. 
Here are a few examples from current and planned Project Kin recipes. Family history activity book that creates a micro challenges that are age appropriate for your audience and connects them with a location, such as a reunion or an occasion, such as a wedding. A multi-generational cookbook organized not by foods, but by people and generations put together as a collaborative effort. A scavenger hunt for children, peppered with challenges that help them discover fun or surprising facts about their ancestors. By thinking of storytelling as a project, you won't be confined to the page. Like Huck Finn whitewashing the fence, you'll create not just a story, but an activity for the next generation to join in on. The through line here is the important stories we tell ourselves about who we are, where we came from, who our people are. These stories, properly documented and absorbed by the next generation, can be picked up where we leave off. Don't be intimidated by the written word. Let your creativity expand to share the stories you've learned about place and all the ways we recognize place today, from maps to models, from recipes to recitations. That's all we're trying to do, because an untold story is a story lost. <laughs>